Good afternoon, everyone. We're ready to get kicked off for our round two. Thank you. I hope everyone had a nice break. We are going to be enjoying cookies and coffee right after this segment, so not that there's not plenty to stick around for, but stick around for cookies and coffee in round three as well. Our first speaker for our second um, segment today, which is focusing on collaborative strategies, useful collaborative strategies, is going to be Keith Bowers. So Keith is the founder and president of Biohabitats. He's a founder and partner of Ecological Restoration and Management Incorporated. For nearly three decades, Keith has been at the forefront of applied ecology, land conservation, and sustainable design. As the founder and president of Biohabitats, he has built a multidisciplinary organization focused on regenerative design. The blurring of boundaries between conservation planning, ecological restoration, and sustainable design. His work has spanned the scale from site-specific ecosystem restoration projects involving wetland, river, woodland, and coastal habitat restoration, to regional watershed management and conservation planning, to the development of comprehensive sustainability programs for communities and campuses throughout the country. Keith is also the founder and partner of Biohabitat's sister company, as I mentioned, Ecological Restoration and Management, which provides professional installation and management services for restoration projects throughout North America. And because this uh, segment is also focusing on the organizations that our speakers represent, I also wanted to pull a little keynote from each of their websites about what they do. And from Biohabitats, at Biohabitats we have purposely built an interdisciplinary an interdisciplinary staff of practitioners who transcend the boundaries of their respective fields. Fueled by knowledge and driven by passion, each one of us is committed to a healthier, more just, and sustainable world. Please help me welcome Keith Bowers. Thank you, everybody. Mike's working okay? Hear me fine? Good, good. So I'm going to be talking about what are useful collaborative strategies to bring ecological science and physical design together. And I'm going to ramble through this a little bit. Um, part of it, talking about what I've learned over the past 35 years in, in working to bring design and ecology together, and also show a couple of maybe case studies or projects of how that has happened. But first, this is a bottlenose dolphin. Um, it's a bottlenose dolphin down in Charleston, South Carolina. Does anybody know what it's doing here? This bottlenose dolphin is strand feeding. So what happens is a pod of dolphins come in, and the dolphins in the front there, you can see the fins, are pushing the fish up onto the mud flat, and one dolphin breaches itself on the mud, always on its right side, and feeds on the fish that the other dolphins are pushing up to them, and then they switch places and go around. This is only one of two spots in the world where bottlenose dolphins exhibit this type of behavior. Um, along the coast of northern Georgia and South Carolina is one also in New Zealand, an, um, another population of bottlenose dolphin do the same thing, but nowhere else. And in fact, in northern South Carolina or up and down the coast, they don't do this type of feeding. And I think what that tells us is that, that just goes back to the whole sense of place and designing ecology for place and how each place throughout the world is really unique. Right? And there are species out there doing things that we don't even know about that are unique, and we're beginning to lose those species and lose those, those processes and, and um, biodiversity that's all wrapped up in there. So when we talk about ecology and design, we're really talking about place-based design. Not site design, but place-based design. The other problem, or the other concern with this is that there's been recent studies of these bottlenose dolphins and they're finding really high concentrations of PCBs, DDTs, PAHs, which have to do with um, the uh, fire retardant chemicals that are used. And in fact, in these uh, populations in Charleston, it, there are over 50% of them have five times the toxic level that they should have with these types of chemicals. And so this is a keystone species that we're beginning to lose. Right? Because of the land use decisions and the way we design land, the way we design products, all our design decisions come back and begin to affect species like this. So again, it's really important. 
Uh, one of the uh, uh, business gurus back in the 70s and 80s, Peter Drucker, who wrote a lot of books on business organizations, basically said culture eats strategy for lunch, which what he means is that building a good culture um, far out passes building a lot of strategies. So in an organization, if you have a really good culture in your organization, that's going to do much better than just trying to put together a lot of strategies and hope people follow them. And I think the same is designed for, the, the same go, holds true for design and ecology, that building a culture of bringing together designers and bringing together ecologists, bringing together social scientists, physical sciences, the biological sciences with designers, and building a culture that's based on everybody that has an equal footing, that's based on a shared vision, is going to far out uh, outplay any type of specific strategies that you could try to implement. So just keep that in mind. A lot of times we don't like to talk about culture like that, or we just don't bring it up because it's messy. It takes time to evolve. It takes time to put in place. But culture is really, I think, the key to bringing together ecology and design. There's a couple paradigms, and we've kind of noticed this in our office as well. So we built an, we built an office based on uh, interdisciplinary approach. My first 10 hires were, I'm a landscape architect. I was trained in landscape architect, but the first 10 people I hired were ecologists, biologists, fluvial geomorphologists, soil scientists, foresters, um, before I hired another designer in the firm. And so right now our firm is built, about half of the firm is built um, with designers whether they're landscape architects or uh, uh, planners or geographers, and the other half is built on all the ologies, right? The biology, the ecology, the geomorphology, the soil science, the foresters. Um, but we notice this tension with designers and with how sort of ecology talks, and this is a good tension, actually, and I think that this is the kind of tension that we need to bring to the table, and at different times, the tension is going to lead one way or the other, um, but it's good to have that tension and play off that tension because I think you end up with a lot better project. So I'm not going to go through all these here, but you know what designers think, what ecologists think, and how we think about things in a slightly different way. And the idea, again, is that we need to kind of celebrate this diversity of thinking and then figure out how to make it all work together. Um, and even, to, you know, to go on, having, you know, thinking about site-based versus place-based, thinking about less is more versus biologically com complex, thinking about <laughs> reactive versus multi-active. We can kind, kind of go down this list and think about how we are trained and how we experience different things in different ways. And having that sort of full vocabulary and bringing that together is, is really important there. Um, this cartoon here, how do you want it? The crystal mumbo jumbo or the st statistical probability, right? So as ecologists and in science, we're trained a lot that, you know, we can do a lot of analysis and we, you know, apply statistics and we have probabilities, but very rarely can we go out there and say definitively this is what's going to happen. Where from the design world, that's what you want to do. You want to say, this is what's going to happen. This is what I'm going to build. This is what I'm going to design. This is what the client expects. And so again, you have that tension of, well, gosh, you know, ecology is always evolving. It's dynamic. Um, we heard some things this morning, you know, whole, all about self-organization, um, all about sort of evolving evolution, where in design, we're trying to build something that in some cases may be static, um, in other cases, we know there's going to be four corners to that building. There, we know that that bench is going to be sitting right there when we come back in five years. Um, and so we've got to reconcile that. We have to reconcile the idea that we have different viewpoints and how that works together is really important here. So this is a project in uh, Galveston, Texas. This is Galveston Island. This is uh, the island, the Gulf of Mexico is on the right bottom. Galveston Bay is on the left. That yellow line going through there is the major road that spans the island here. And you see a housing development down here on the bottom, and you see housing on the top, and that expanse in between is Galveston Island State Park. And Galveston Island State Park um, is a lovely park. It's one of the highest revenue generating parks in the whole state of Texas because people come down there to camp and bring their 
There are mobile homes down there. There are RVs down there and do all sorts of things. Um, this is the campground at Galveston Island State Park. You see it's behind some of the dunes that they began to restore there. Gulf of Mexico in the background. This was after Hurricane Ike came through. Not Hurricane Harvey recently, but Hurricane Ike um, about uh, 10 years ago came through there and completely wrecked uh, this uh, state park here and did all kinds of damage throughout Galveston Island. Um, so Texas Parks and Wildlife took a look at this and they said, well, how do we rebuild this state park? Do we do it like it was before or do we start considering these kinds of factors like climate change and sea level rise and storm surges? And they said, if we're going to rebuild this park, we want to do it in a more resilient way. And so what they did is they put together a team, and we were on that team with another uh, landscape architecture firm, Studio Outside, out of Dallas, Texas, to work together with them to come up with a more resilient way of designing this park in the future to take into account some of, the thing, some of these changes we're beginning to see that we heard all about this morning here. And so one of the things that we were brought in to do to work with the designers and landscape architects is to look at the habitat, right? What's endangered habitat out there and how is that habitat going to shift over time based on these kinds of uh, uh, disturbances and impacts happening? What's happening with sea level rise and how do we model that? Um, we also know that in some cases the land's subsiding. So not only is the sea rising, but the land is subsiding. So how does that whole dynamic interaction work? Um, and then to come up with some predictive model simulations over the next 50 years so that as, as designers we can take that and begin thinking about, well, where do we uh, restore roads? Where do we place these new picnic structures? How do we interpret the landscape in the future for park users that want to come down and experience sort of, you know, a, a natural space in between all that development at Galveston Island State Park? And so this is a, a prairie, a coastal prairie complex here. It looks great. It's, um, it's basically on its way to recovery. Back in the late 1800s, a lot of this area was farmed, cattle grazing through here. And so a lot of the impacts from that cattle grazing are still being seen in terms of the vegetative, the natural vegetative community coming back in the soils. Um, but it's starting to come back. But all this is going to change based on sea level rise based on uh, not only the, how the sea is going to rise in Galveston Bay and the Gulf of Mexico, um, but what Christina talked about earlier, groundwater, and how groundwater is going to fluctuate in here and be begin to change this coastal prairie community. So one of the things that we did is we worked again with the designers to come up with this cross-section of, of Galveston Island, looked at the different habitats here, went out and measured them. We also partnered with the University of Texas and other experts in the region that have a lot more uh, experience in this part of the country than we do to kind of bring all this to bear in terms of, again, how do we think about it from a design standpoint. We also took a step back and looked at it from a landscape ecology perspective. Um, what kind of species are migrating through this area? What kinds of, how is the hydrology flowing, sediment flows um, into Galveston Bay and out of Galveston Bay? And really, that's one of the things that, um, you know, a lot of the type of work that we're doing, not only are we looking at it from the site or place-based standpoint, but we're also zooming back out at the 30 or 40,000 foot level and looking at how this site is interconnected um, with the landscape surrounding it, with the region or potentially with the continent as well. We went through and did a lot of these sea level rise modeling here, and we came up with different predictions based on um, what the uh, other, mod, you know, people have done a lot of sea level rise modeling in the past. And so looking at that modeling, we've come up, we came up with three different sea level rise predictions here. We came up with accretion rates. In other words, sediment's going to be moving in and actually building up as at the same time the sea is rising. And then there's subsidence rates, right, in terms of the land actually falling. So we went through and did a lot of that modeling to come up with simulations. <laughs> And this is one of the simulations. This is 2010 as it existed then, and you can notice the white dashed line along there. By the way, all those little squares up there, that was a previous attempt to do wetland restoration in Galveston Bay. And the idea there was to build these cells 
um, and then allow sediment to flow over and fill up these cells, and then the cells would revegetate. And that actually never happened. So it was this idea of kind of using active restoration combined with passive restoration to make this work, it didn't work. And so that's, you know, in terms of we talk about adaptive management, it's a really good way to try out things and what would work and what won't work. But keep your eye on that white dash and keep your eye on the road down there and where the shoreline is. And this is what it would look like in 2060 based on those um, predictions, right? How the shoreline's going to retreat both in the Gulf of Mexico, in fact, it's going to come up into the main road that connects the whole island, and how the Galveston Bay is going to encroach onto the site as well. Pretty interesting going from this to this. So that tells you if you're going to put in new park infrastructure, where do you want to put it? How do you want to redesign these park campgrounds in a way that's going to be resilient to this kind of thing happening in the future? The other really interesting part was looking at those, those vegetative communities and looking and modeling them and how they're going to shift over time based on sea level rise, based on groundwater intrusion. And you go from a, a community that, that, from a composition standpoint, looks like this to a community that looks like this in 50 years. So it's drastically going to change. And so as a national, as a state park, how do you interpret that change for visitors that are coming there? Um, and then again, how do you design facilities in such a way that take that kind of change into place? <coughs> so this is just sort of one example of thinking through that idea, right? Of putting in the spine of this infrastructure here um, on the left-hand side, having these campgrounds out here and knowing that in 50 years they might be standing above water, right? So how can you design infrastructure now that's resilient to change in the future and combining the whole idea of ecology and design together into one project. So this is something that uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife is now beginning to incorporate on a, in a lot of their projects in terms of looking at how does ecology, how does, how does sea level rise, how does um, climate change, how do plants and plant compositions and ecological processes and flows change based on this type of thing here. So some of, those, some of the collaborative tactics that we look at when we try to combine the idea of design and ecology together is, number one, it needs to be from the beginning, right? A lot of times, not a lot of times, but sometimes we're brought in too late in a project and we're asked to then look at it from an ecological perspective and by then it's too late. There's decisions that have already been made, there's visions or there's, there's um, ideas that have already been put forward that people are banking on. And so the first thing is, from the beginning, it's got to be this sort of marriage of ecology and design. Second of all, it has to be about that place, right? It has to be about the place you're working in. Um, and if it's not about place, if it's not designed for that place and for that place as it was in the, in the past, but more importantly as that place in the future, um, then it's not going to work. In design, we're taught form follows function. In ecology, we're, you know, we're looking at certainly processes lead to function, which lead to composition, which lead to structure. So the same sort of concept, but maybe said in a slightly different way, but starting all the way back at processes. And in ecology, that's what we really need to be concerned about first and foremost, is what processes are going on. And then the idea that we're trying to blur the boundaries, right? Blur the boundaries between what ecology is and what design is. Um, and how to, you know, how to do that in an effective way of taking those sort of paradigms that I talked about and how do we blur them? How much time do I have? Whatever you need. Okay. Starting to um, Connectivity is a huge issue in ecology, right? Um, and we, we, design, we design a lot of, um, we being all of us, design projects where we move people from point A to point B, we give people homes, we give people places to work, we give people places to shop. Um, but from an ecological standpoint, are we doing the same thing for species, right? Are we giving them those places to move about the landscape? Are we giving those, them those places to feed, to breed, to, to live out their life cycle? And we're fragmenting the heck out of the earth right now. and We're not giving them their right to um, uh, evolve over time because we're, all that fragmentation is taking place. And so the co connectivity is really the key to a lot of projects, and that's something we try to stress almost more than anything else in projects we work with. Even though we might have set boundaries, the idea that we need to connect landscapes together is critically important. 
This idea of adaptive management, which we may hear more about later in the research section. Um, it, you know, nothing's set in stone. We're all learning still. We all have a long way to learn. Restoration ecology, conservation biology, they're all relatively new sciences. Um, and we need to go out there and we need to do thoughtful adaptive management where we need to think about different hypotheses, apply them to the landscape, see what's working, and then take what's working and scale that up in an effective way. I love the term deliberately emergent, right? That we need to be spontaneous but reflective. In other words, we need to act quickly on things that might not be going right from a design ecological standpoint, but we need to be really reflective when we do that about what caused um, that trajectory to go off course, how do we move it back on course, and how do we, we respond to change in the future. And then I won't get into this because that's what the whole third part of the program is today, the whole idea about research and about bringing practitioners and researchers together um, to really think about how we adaptively manage these types of projects. So one more project I'll take you through. This is in Portland, Oregon, and we were um, uh, contracted by the uh, Clean Water Services, which is the wastewater utility in Oregon. And they came up and they said, you know, for um, our whole, our, the whole, whole, whole organizational lifespan, we've been working with engineers to design wastewater treatment plants, and we really think we need to be working with ecologists with engineers to design wastewater treatment plants. And so we began thinking with them about what would a wastewater treatment plant look like if you were to design it from an ecological perspective. Um, this site's called Fern Hill. It's on the Tualatin River, which flows down to the Willamette River, which flows out in, in um, to the, oh, help me, the big Columbia River. Thank you, I went right on my head to the Columbia River, right? So it's, um, it's revered for salmon, obviously, as much of the Pacific Northwest is. And this site here, uh, the wastewater treatment site is up on the left. These are these uh, big settling ponds they have out there where basically they're hoping that they can get nitrogen removal, but the problem is they're not getting much nitrogen removal. The water temperatures are spiking and they have to hold all this water during the summertime and can't release it to the river because of the, temp the high temperatures um, in terms of impacting fish habitat or in the late spring and early summer. And so what they have to do is shut down the wastewater treatment plant and go back to their, and reroute all the waste to other wastewater treatment plants that are using mechanical means to filter all that. So we worked with them to redesign this in a way that not only removes the nitrogen um, uh, content in there, but also looks at lowering water temperatures, but also brings back wetland habitat in this really important flyway along the, the river here. So the first thing we did, um, while, while Clean Water Services, while we had our mandate from them to focus on nitrogen and temperature, we also said from an ecological perspective, we need to think about some focal species that we want to design for. Right, what are we designing this for in particular? So we went through a, a, a sort of a peer-reviewed um, uh, analysis of what focal species we were going to design this for. Then we went out and began looking at reference sites, reference wetlands in the Tualatin River Basin to find out the composition of plant material, look at the hydro periods, look at what types of soil they grow in, and how that would then influence what we were going to design for this project here. So these are these three basins that I showed earlier in terms of, of the water flowing from the wastewater treatment plant up top here into these basins, and these are settling basins again. How could we think about redesigning this? The Tualatin River is right below us here, um, or below this, uh, off the screen, and this all flows through a pipe to the river. So the whole idea of also looking at um, uh, flow through the sediment. How could we flow this water underground to cool it even more before it gets to the river was a really important aspect here. So the idea was how could we turn this into an engineered system that again uh, provided the ecological parameters that we were looking for here and started coming up with some, some design parameters that looked at different habitat types um, but also looked at what happened when this was flooded during flood events or during um, uh, high, high use from the wastewater treatment plant and how the, this water interacted with the plant material and soils to remove nitrogen and lower water temperatures. Um, but also how does it relate to the surrounding 
uh, uh, landscape as well. And so, and so we went through a lot of analysis, the engineers and the ecologists looking back and forth between how do we design this from an ecological perspective and how do we design it from an engineering perspective. Did a lot of temperature modeling, did a lot of uh, nitrogen loading modeling, um, um, and looked at those analysis and came up with a project that uh, they were able to implement over a period of about a year where we went in and we completely redid this area here. So this was the beginning of the grading for those three basins that I showed earlier of creating these ponds here and this new pathway for the water to flow through here. Um, highly engineered. Um, so it, they can really control water levels going through different parts of this project to make sure that they can get that water quality that they, they need, plus that we can control the water levels in here to make sure it has enough residence time to interact with the soils and plants. But then we were able to add a lot of other features in here, like these snags and dead logs for habitat in here. Um, and then went out and, and planted this with a lot of those native plants. This was a celebration of the kickoff, and those folks are throwing mud balls out there that are filled with native seed, right, as a way to celebrate <laughs> the opening of this, um, which was a, lo a lot of fun there. But, you know, this is after the first growing season here, and this is what it looks like today. And so this is a wastewater treatment plant is providing that tertiary treatment. It's really designed as much for the ecological floodplain, the ecological systems along the Tualatin River as it is for the actual wastewater treatment plant itself. So the whole idea that you can combine design and ecology in a really meaningful way, I think, shows through here. There's a lot of monitoring and research being done on this to prove that out, and so that's great. The other great thing is it's become a real birding mecca for um, that part of Portland, so people come there from far and wide to do birding. They also have a birds and brew festival where they actually take the water, no kidding, from this wetland, and they brew beer out of it. And they sell that, and they have a, uh, a birds and brew festival there. And then they're taking some of the solids from the wastewater treatment plant and turning that into fertilizer, right? So it's a whole idea of how can you start growing local economy here with this type of project in terms of integrating in the ecological aspects as well. And they, got all, they have all kinds of volunteers coming and storting the place too. Um, which is great because it gets the whole community involved. So it, again, before there was big signs posted, you know, stay out, this is wastewater treatment. Now it's become this great place where a lot of people use this site. Just lastly, um, we're just about to undertake this. In fact, next week, the city of Atlanta came and they're looking at their growth in the next 35 years. And they came up with sort of three legs to the stool one, they want to look at how development will occur in Atlanta in 30 years. They want to look at transportation systems. And the third leg is ecology. So they're, they're putting ecology up with transportation and, and development and saying, how can ecology be an important component of how the city of Atlanta grows in the next 30 years? So this whole idea of bringing ecology into urban areas and, and really integrating that in with and, and on a level playing field with transportation and with development is really exciting. And we're starting to see this work, you know, all over the country, if not all over the world, in doing that. And it's certainly going to have a, a huge social environmental um, justice context as well in terms of why certain areas were developed the way they were, what, what is their ecological potential, but what is the environmental and social justice issues that occur there. And so I'll just leave, lastly, with this. Uh, um, the, the fierce urgency of now is from Dr. Martin Luther King talking about um, uh, you know, racism and, and uh, African-American rights. And I think there's a couple things going on that kind of reiterate what was talked about this morning. One, we're sort of under this age of reckless consumption right now. I think we can all kind of agree to that. We've got climate change going on, which we heard all about that this morning a loss of biodiversity. Um, um, in fact, some scientists are calling it the next great extinction, right? But that hardly ever gets talked about in the public at all. Um, we've got huge social environmental justice issues, right? And I would say that if we thought about design strictly from a biodiversity standpoint, the idea that all species have rights, nature has rights, and if we thought about design from that standpoint, 
and we thought about design from a social environmental justice standpoint. And just those two things alone, I think we would begin to take care of those first two issues up there in terms of reckless consumption and, and climate change. And what Randy Hester, who is a professor of landscape architecture out in Berkeley, um, kind of coined the phrase, the whole idea of ecological democracy. So it kind of goes back to what David Orr was talking about earlier today. What if we could rewrite our constitution? Would we have ecological democracy? Could we have a declaration of interdependence instead of independence, right? And think about it from that standpoint. So how can design and ecology do all that for us? Thank you.